present our um, lecture uh, presenter this evening. I'm going to talk a little bit about Dr. John Fleming here for just a moment. John is an orthopedic uh, surgeon, spine surgeon, specifically in the South Bay. He grew up in Chicago, but was drawn to California because of the sunshine, of course. Uh, and, of course, he went to uh, USC uh, for his undergraduate training. <clears throat> and he had uh, emphasis in medical ethics. He completed his medical school at UC San Diego and was followed uh, by his internship um, at UCLA Harbor. He completed his spine surgery fellowship training under both orthopedic and neurosurgeons. And, and that's very, very specific, and it's, it's real important with what he's going to be sharing tonight. Um, he completed this at Leatherman Spine Institute in Louisville, Kentucky. Dr. Fleming has sought out well-rounded training in both traditional and novel surgical techniques to be able to tailor an evidence-based technique and treatment plan to each patient's specific condition, needs, personal values, and expectations. When outside of the hospital, the doctor likes to hike, paddleboard, and he enjoys the nearby beaches. Let us welcome John Fleming. So, um, just to give you kind of the visual representation of my resume that you just got right there, makes it a little easier. So I did grow up in Chicago, Illinois, a beautiful city, but perhaps better represented by this picture of a fireman trying to put out a fire with snow, um, because liquid water does not exist in that city about three or four months out of the year. Um, so as you can imagine, that was what brought me over to here, where I went to USC for undergrad. Um, not really ever wanting to make it back over there. I then went down all the way to UC San Diego for my medical school training, um, and then made it all the way back up here to Torrance, uh, Harbor UCLA for my internship and residency. And then I said over to Louisville, Kentucky, a uh, slight departure for uh, my spine training. Or to put that in another more succinct way, I spent most of my life in IHOP territory and a very small portion in Waffle House territory, which I didn't know was a big deal until I got there and realized they're very serious about Waffle House. Um, now proud to be a part of uh, the group out here known as Coastal Ortho. It used to be called Torrance Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Group. Um, our name is now a little bit less of a mouthful. Um, fun fact about this picture, this was actually the day that all of me and my partners realized that we had, for many reasons, no future in a modeling career. Because about a hundred pictures in, I just saw the photographer looking despondently down at her camera at all the pictures she had taken. And she said to us, I just don't understand what you're doing with your hands. She's like, please just try and look natural for one minute. Um, and then 100 pictures later, this is still the best we can come up with. So um, that's where we are. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about a few different topics. So I wanted to focus on some of the questions that I get most commonly in my clinic, some things that, that I find a lot of people are, are concerned about. So um, first of all, we're going to talk about how common is the back pain what's causing the back pain, how can we fix it, how can we prevent it, when should you be concerned and come and see me, when is surgery actually necessary, and then follow up with what's new in spine surgery. So um, the first question, how common is my back pain? We can start this off here. I'd like everyone just to raise their hands if they are having any back pain now or have recently. I'm guessing almost everybody. Okay, now keep your hands up. I want you to leave your hands up if you feel like you've gotten an adequate reason or diagnosis for why you have that back pain. Probably about half of, yeah, half, half of people are so brought down. So that's good. That means that I can still have a job after this because um, I can tell you a few things. All right. So first of all, how common is the back pain? Even more than you might think. So 50% of working Americans every year are going to report some form of back pain. Low back pain is the second most common cause to come into a primary care physician, the first one just being colds, flus, and nose uh, infections. Um, so 80% of the U.S. population is going to experience back pain at some point in their lives. Now, that's a huge number. I just kind of want to put that into context. So 61% of Americans own a smartphone. So if you take everyone you know that owns a smartphone, and even half the people that own flip phones, that's probably how many people have back pain. 68% uh, of Americans have seen a Star Wars movie. That's like even the bad ones. 80% um, of people have home internet access, and 80% of people live within 20 miles of a Starbucks, which allows you this mind-bending opportunity to be sitting inside of a Starbucks and looking across the street at another Starbucks. It's pretty frequent. Um, and sometimes they even spell your names correctly. This is an actual cup that I got when I went to Starbucks, and I told them that my name is John with an H, and I 
can't really blame him for that, I guess. So those are good news. So many people have back pain. It's very common. What's the good news in this? Well, the good news in this, and the one thing that I want to stress in this lecture today out of everything, is that most cases of back pain are mechanical, which means they're not caused by any serious medical conditions. And what that means is that over 90% of these pains that you may have can be relieved without any invasive procedures, including surgery. That makes most backs pretty happy. So what's causing your back pain? Um, so... This is a pretty complicated diagram. It's supposed to be because that means, again, that you still need me. Um, back is a completely complex enterprise of bones, muscles, ligaments, joints, and nerves, any of which could be causing pain in that area. There are dozens of potential pain generators. The muscles can get strained, weak, or imbalanced. The ligaments can be sprained. The discs can be ruptured. The joints can be irritated. So all of these things can be a cause of back pain, but very few of them are actually serious enough to warrant any kind of surgical treatment. So why are there so many causes of back pain in all of this? Well, the truth is, is that we're new to this, this being upright walking. In a relatively short period of evolutionary time, we went from walking on four limbs, as our primate ancestors did, to this upright walking. We evolved this so that we could chase our prey. They were all herbivores, and they had to stop to eat every few hours. And with this upright walking, we had much more efficient walking, could follow them, could hunt them, and the like. The downside of this, though, is this is not originally what the spine was designed for. It was designed to sit flat like this, to walk on the knuckles and walk on four limbs. So if you were to design a robot today to walk upright, you would not do it the way that our spines are designed. You wouldn't make, like, 50 different segments with this useless tailbone right here. You would have a more succinct design. But we don't have that, so we kind of live with the backs that we've got now. So how can we fix it? I guess one option is to go back to walking on your knuckles, but that's not really socially acceptable in most work settings, so you can't do that, although we may be getting there with time. Um, the basics of how we can fix back pain. So this is the broadest strokes you can possibly come up with for how to keep yourself healthy and keep your back out of pain. The first key tenant is to strengthen, relax, and balance all the supporting muscles of your spine. When the muscles do the work of holding you upright, your spine doesn't have to. So the bones, the ligaments, the joints, there's less stress on them, the stronger your muscles are. Reduce inflammation and minimize pain. That's a goal for everybody. And optimize your posture as best you can. These are the best ways to keep your back in its healthiest shape. So how do we go about doing that? Now, the one thing that I think everybody here can do today is this home exercise or flexibility program. So all it takes is going to Google. I want you, you can write this down. I want you to type in Mayo Clinic back exercises. The first link that you're going to come up with is this slideshow that shows you how to do back exercises. This is strength, this is range of motion, everything in 15 minutes per day. It's a good place to start. You may end up needing some more than that, but it's a good thing that everybody can do just to get your back in the healthiest position. So you're going to focus on the core, the back, and the supporting muscles. Um, Another thing that's sometimes difficult today is stand whenever possible, walk when you can, stay active. Prolonged sitting leads to slouching, slouching leads to worse posture, and that leads inevitably to back pain. So, on a more specific sense, um, there's a couple of different things I'm going to go through for kind of the non-operative treatment of back pain, and I've divided them out into these two basic categories. So, the traditional categories and the integrative categories. It's a distinction we've come up with. So the traditional medicines, they're more widely studied. This is kind of what we consider our basic Western medicine, the things that we have been studying for years, decades, and sometimes centuries. Um, there's a very good base of evidence and long-term outcomes in the research that we have proving what these can do. The downside of this is it's a limited number of options that we've kind of come up with, and that may plateau your improvement at some point. So I'm also going to introduce some integrative modalities. So what that means is things that were formerly known as complementary and alternative treatments, but now they've begun to integrate into our own Western medicine and the way that we treat things. Um, there's a little bit shorter track record in Western medicine, but usually a lot longer track record in Eastern medicine. Um, but they've been gradually increasing in use every year, and the key here is that these are evidence-based. Everything I'm going to talk to you about tonight has good scientific evidence to support it, even if it is an integrative therapy. So traditional therapies, let's start with these. So physical therapy. This is kind of the mainstay because the physical therapists are essentially the foot soldiers of back pain. Um, of all my patients that come to me, probably 80% of them are at some point going to go to a physical therapist. They come back to me and they tell me, oh, my pain is so much better. You're a miracle worker. I have nothing to do with that. It's all the physical therapists. I'm going to take the credit, of course, where I can, but really it's not me. It's the physical therapists and what they do every day. 
So there's a lot of different modalities between manual therapy, TENS units, electrical stim, ultrasound, heat and cold. They do all these things, and they're all very well shown in research to increase function and decrease pain. We can go through later what kind of each one of these is um, in sacred. Uh, so aqua therapy is another step. So aqua therapy utilizes the natural buoyancy you have in the pool. So you're going to float naturally in the pool. This is going to relieve the pressure on the spine, and it's going to make it much easier to do the exercises you need to do. Basically, everything you do in the pool will be a core strengthening kind of an exercise, which is the key to keeping your back pain down. Um, this is especially good for people who have pain in any other joints, pain in the hips, pain in the knees, things that keep you from doing traditional exercise or traditional therapy. This is a way that you can relieve some of that pressure Go on to do it. You don't always have to wear a hole and get up like this. It's actually a lot easier than this. Um, the next class is the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These are called NSAIDs. Um, so there's a lot of over-the-counter and a lot of different prescription options that we can do. Some of them are pills. Some of them are topical. They all work in the same way, and that's to block the formation of inflammatory substances. You've all seen these. You've all probably taken Advil or ibuprofen or Aleve at some point. So there's a proven reduction in pain, increase in function, and they've been around for a very, very long time. There's caution, of course, as there is with every prescription or even over-the-counter medicine. These are good for short periods of time, but they're not the best for daily long-term use. Eventually, they can lead to stomach upset, sometimes even ulcers, and they could lead to renal or kidney dysfunction later in life. You take them every day also. Uh, so muscle relaxants, another traditional therapy. So the purpose of muscle relaxants and the mechanism they work by is to sort of reduce the activating signal that you have to your muscles. So a lot of back pain is caused by spasms in the back, spasms of the muscles that are around your spine. And that can be very, very painful when those muscles tighten up. The goal of these medicines is to let those muscles relax to stop those activating factors. So a Cochrane review, this is a review that takes all the research that's available and kind of synthesizes it into one final statement. And they've shown that there's significant benefit over placebo for acute, and this is important, acute short-term low back pain. So these medicines can be very useful and helpful over the short term. If you have suddenly thrown your back out doing something, you have a lot of muscle spasms, these can help you get through that. But they're not the best, again, for long-term daily use because their effects plateau after a while. And the caution here is they can cause dizziness, sleepiness, or even this high feeling right here. Um, so what about opioids? Another question that I get. So probably you've heard a lot about opioids recently in the news and the opioid crisis in America. Now this is, opioids are something that has been prescribed for back pain over the last several years or decades pretty frequently. Um, people ended up on opioids for a very long-term period of time for back pain, knee pain, arthritis. So this is a brand new study. It just came out about a month ago. So they randomly assigned a large group of patients to either getting these opioids, these Nor Norco, Percocet, Oxycontin, things you may have heard of, or just the kind of standard anti-inflammatories, just over-the-counter Advil, over-the-counter Tylenol. And this is for arthritis or back pain specific. A lot of them were back pain patients. And looked at those patients over the course of a year or two to see how they did. So you look at this, the pain improved in 41% in the strong medicine group, and even more, 54% in the people getting just the regular anti-inflammatories. So this is kind of begging the question of, with all these side effects that we have from opioids, all the potential for dependence and things like that, is it even worth it to use it? And for back pain, this is not really probably the best option for a couple of reasons. For one, they work in your brain very well at masking pain, but the result of that is you may be moving when you're on these medicines in a way that's not beneficial to your back, that your back doesn't want to move, and you won't feel it because you've masked it. That can sometimes cause increases in your pain. And secondarily, there's kind of diminishing returns when you start taking these medicines. As you start taking them, you just need more and more because your brain adapts. And then over the long term, this can lead to more pain. So these aren't usually the best for the low back pain that most people have. Um, more traditional therapies, and the next step on this is to go to steroid injections or nerve ablations. So um, these are epidural injections usually, similar to what women get when they're pregnant, an epidural there. Um, except instead of that numbing medicine, it's an anti-inflammatory medicine. It can go around the nerves or around several nerves. You can also do nerve blocks through the small joints in the spine. That usually helps to relieve with back pain. So it's a bit controversial. Some studies have shown help and some have not, but it's usually agreed upon that meta-studies, studies that study lots of studies, um, have shown improvement in pain if you have certain spinal conditions. So it is one arrow in the quiver of things that we can use for back pain. 
Uh, now I'm going to talk about some of these integrative therapies. So these are the things that uh, possibly have a little bit shorter track record in Western medicine. But again, everything I'm going to talk about here today has good evidence for it. So what is integrative medicine? So integrative medicine is defined by the Academy for uh, Complementary and Alternative Medicine as a diverse medical and healthcare system, practice, and products that are not traditionally considered part of conventional medicine. Um, so although they, were, they used to be called alternative medicines, they're currently used by about a third of Americans and up to 70% of people who have musculoskeletal conditions like back pain and arthritis. So the other key fact here is that these are kind of underreported or not disclosed to doctors, and you go and see them about 60% of the time, so more than half the time. So why is that? Now, this may come as a shock to you, so I want you to all remain seated, but this may be because some doctors are a little egotistical and a little bit old school. Um, I know, it's shocking. Uh, so much so that if you actually type into Google uh, egotistical doctor cartoon, you get so many of them that I just couldn't even fill up one slide with it. Um, but it doesn't really have to be this way. So it used to be that we only studied these certain things and then we kind of plateaued there. Um, now we're starting to do more and more research into these integrative therapies and the way that they can work together with the therapies we're already using to give you that extra little bit of help to possibly avoid a surgery or avoid anything else uh, uh, detrimental to you. So part of the reason that these haven't been studied so much recently is something called the streetlight theory. So it's all based on this old joke. There's this drunkard who keeps searching around by a streetlight, and the police officer sees him looking around. And the cop comes over and he says, well, what is it that you're doing here? What are you looking for? And the drunk says, oh, I lost my keys and I'm trying to look for them. So the cop starts to help him. They start to turn over leaves and rocks. They root through the grass. They're looking everywhere for his keys. Finally, after finding nothing, the police officer asks him, well, are you sure you lost them over here? And the drunk says, well, no, I think I dropped them over there in the park. So the cop says, well, why are you looking here? And the drunk guy says, well, the light is better over here. <laughs> the light is better over here kind of describes why we've studied kind of the same things for so long. It's much easier to look where the light is better, to look where people have looked before to study things that have been studied before. So that's why we focus on that for so long. But that's not always the right place to look. Sometimes you have to search a little bit in the dark before you can find the right thing. So some of the best, so let's talk about herbal remedies. So some of the best evidence we have for really any herbal remedy uh, comes to turmeric. So the principal ingredient of this is something called curcumin. So you may see this on the bottle as either turmeric or curcumin. It's the same thing. So this has a very long history of safe use in foods and in Chinese medicine. Um, even since 1949, we've recognized that there are good antibacterial properties to this particular root. Um, it comes in the ginger family. It's this yellowish root right here. Um, so much so that even the MD Anderson Cancer Center, one of the leading cancer centers in Houston and the nation, um, has shown anti-carcinogenic properties in multiple cancers, prostate, lung, kidney, uh, breast, all of these things. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm suggesting just eat a bunch of curry if you have cancer. There's lots of other therapies, obviously, but it is something that's worth looking into. Now, the reason that we're interested in it is for its anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. These are the ways that it can help you with your long-term back pain in a more sustainable basis. So there are recent studies that reviewed multiple different high-quality trials, and they found a similar benefit to taking anti-inflammatory, uh, for the anti-inflammatory properties of NSAIDs, those Aleve and uh, things that can potentially cause gastric upset, and turmeric, but with fewer gastric side effects. So there's a significant reduction in pain for osteoarthritis and decrease in the inflammatory markers. Um, so much so, this is just a little bit of that. It's kind of busy, but we really need to know is the further left you get on this line, and these are all different studies, all these lines right here, this is a proven benefit um, to turmeric over either nothing or over other pain medicines. And all of these studies have shown that. So the side effects for this are usually only after really high doses over really long periods of time. Um, sometimes you can get indigestion, diarrhea, nausea, um, but less so than with the other anti-inflammatory medicines. The one caveat to this, if you have any gallbladder disease, that's the one thing you have to watch out for. So beyond the pill treatments, chiropractic care. So there's also good evidence for chiropractic care. There have been several different studies in lots of different journals, chiropractic journals and the medical journals looking at this. So compared to having no treatment at all, a chiropractic adjustment has uh, showed a slight but real improvement in pain and disability in both the short and the medium term. And the real benefit, I think, of chiropractic care, because a lot of my patients come in and they ask me about it, is that there's relatively no side effects. And in fact, for back adjustment, there's never been a serious adverse event from back adjustments. 
And spine surgeons certainly can't say that about their practice, so I'm more than happy to have people go and try chiropractic care to see if it helps you. Um, 15% of the time, you can have a minor or temporary increase of pain, but that always goes away. Now, the one caveat to that is that sometimes with neck manipulation, there has been some incidents. Now, there's been 26 deaths, deaths from chiropractic adjustment, but that's ever and all the neck adjustments that have been done in the country. So again, that's a very, very low complication. So what it leads me to tell most of my patients, if you have back pain and you want to go to the chiropractor, just do it. There's essentially no downside. You might as well try it, and it might make you better. For neck pain, it's almost always safe for almost everybody. There are a few rare people that I will tell not to go and get a neck adjustment, but that's very, very few and far between. Um, so massage therapy. Um, this is actually in Thailand. You can get this. It's called an elephant massage. Um, as a back doctor, I can't recommend it, but if you go to Bangkok and you feel the need, you can get that there. Um, this is a slide that a lot of people like because it sort of justifies the massages that you may like to go and get. Um, so whatever price there is, it might be worth it. So there have been 15 high-quality trials for back and neck pain in terms of massage and how much it helps. So massage patients had better immediate effects on pain in pretty much all of these studies compared to an inactive treatment like just taking medications or something like that. Um, scented candles and smooth jazz added no benefit. That wasn't actually in the study. I'm just trying to rid the world of Kenny G as best I can. Uh, acupuncture, the next one. Even more evidence for this, and sometimes even more exciting. There have been 29 controlled trials that have studied acupuncture. And in essentially all of them, acupuncture markedly approved, uh, uh, improved the uh, back and neck pain in these patients, and that's compared to both alternative treatments and to sham or pretend procedures. So what that means is just to get the best evidence for this, they didn't want people to know which kind of treatment they were getting. So they either gave them traditional acupuncture, which relied on the traditional places to place the needles, or they essentially stuck needles in any random place to see if those patients would get better. Um, and those patients didn't as much as actual acupuncture. So there's very small difference between where you place that needle and if it's working or not, but that's created a profound effect there. So it shows us that there really is something to acupuncture, and I'll recommend it to all my patients that have sort of plateaued with traditional therapy. So those are the things we can do to treat it. Now, how can we prevent it? How can we keep the back pain from getting worse? How can we avoid flare-ups, and how can we prevent any more of them? So the number one way to do this is to stay fit. This has been shown time and time again. So a lower BMI and a core muscle that's strong and flexible is going to lead to lower back pain over your entire life. The longer you can stay fit and thin, the more relief you're going to have in back pain and the less chance you're going to have of someday needing some kind of a spinal procedure or having a significant amount of back pain. Now, I realize this is a catch-22. If you have a lot of back pain, it's very, very hard to get out there and stay active and exercise enough that you can lose weight. So I recognize that, and I know that's hard. That's kind of where diet and nutrition can come into play, but it's something that's worth treating because this shows that if we get these therapies going, if we can reduce the inflammation, get you up enough that you can actually exercise and you can lose some weight, it's going to be progressive, and it's going to keep building on itself and keep your back pain low. Um, the risk of back pain is nearly twice as high if you have an elevated BMI and increase proportionally. The more and more weight you gain, especially truncal obesity here we call it, so any kind of fat that you have in your belly, it increases the sloping forward of your back and it increases your risks of back pain. Um, so stay fit, yoga and Pilates. So this has actually had eight different trials looking at these two different exercise treatments. So they've shown that it's very, very good for low back pain. The most consistent evidence is in short term getting back to the things that you do. So short-term disability means not being able to do your daily activities, not being able to do the normal stuff that you would do. Now, getting into the yoga and Pilates is a way to most consistently prevent that. Um, if you're like me, most guys, you're looking at this and saying, I'm not going to do yoga. There's no way, no how. I don't blame you for that. Um, I'll just say you don't have to wear the yoga pants if that helps you feel better. Um, I also probably will not be doing this, even though I know that it could help you. Um, so mindfulness techniques, the next part of this. So mindfulness techniques include things like meditation, biofeedback, and guided imagery. This is essentially just being in tune with your body and guided imagery and guided pain relief in that way. Um, so there's an app called Headspace. It's available on all the different phones and all the different app stores. It's something that helps you through guided imagery and helps you through meditation. It's something that I think is very cheap on the app store that everybody could do. So they've even done eight trials with this, with these different kind of mindfulness things of meditation. 
And there's a substantial reduction in pain in all eight of these trials, and that's the key thing. And this costs almost no money, it takes almost no time, and it's a shown improvement that you can get without any trips to a doctor's office, any trip to physical therapy, and really any money. So, um, those are the things we can do to treat, the things we can do to prevent. So, the next part of this comes into the when should I be concerned. And I again want to stress, this is going to be a minority of people with back pain. These are going to be the things that you want to look out for. This is when you come and see me, but it's not going to apply to most people. So, some of the warning signs. Now, this is one of the more common ones. So, this is when you have pain that radiates into the, from the back and then into your legs. Usually the back of your leg, but could be anywhere in your leg. So, you could have some numbness and tingling. You could have some weakness from this, but it's a pain that goes all the way down. So, this may signal that you have a pinching of the nerves as they leave the spine. I'm going to put in italics all the medical words for this just because they're a ridiculous number of letters, and it just shows that we named them this so that you can't put them into WebMD because you'll never be able to spell them. Um, but radiculopathy is what we call this particular thing. It just means a pinching of the nerve. So sometimes the discs in the back can pinch these nerves as they're leaving the spine. This is a view from the side of a disc pushing backwards towards some of your nerves. And then once that nerve is pinched up here in your spine, it follows the path of that nerve all the way down. And it can cause pain all the way in that nerve as it goes down your leg. Um, looking at an MRI here. So I go through all my MRIs with my patients. I kind of show them what they're looking at. So this is looking at somebody from the side. They're facing over here to the left. Their belly is in this area. The back part of them is in this area. And this right here is the spine. So each one of these gray blocks are the bones of the spine. And in between all of these kind of black blobs right here, these are the discs. So if you look up here, these discs stay pretty well underneath the bones. They're not bulging very far. And then you see right here, this is where you have a problem that some people can have of a bulging disc. Now, up here, this black stripe is the spinal cord, and all these gray stripes coming off it are all the nerves in your spine. These are where the nerves can get pinched as they're in your spine, which can lead to pain down the leg. This white space right here is the fluid or the space they have to float around in. Think of that as the canal or the path for those nerves. So up here, everything is fine, nothing's getting pinched, until you get down to this one area right here where you see a little pinching of the nerve. So that's what can lead to this pain that shoots down your leg. So one caveat to this, so even if you have back pain, even if you have pain shooting down your leg, it still may not be something within your spine. The other kind of thing that masquerades as a back issue or herniated disc or something like that very often is this nerve right here. So you may have heard of this from sciatica. This is called the sciatic nerve. So this travels in between two muscles right here, which puts it in a perfect position to get pinched in between those two muscles when they get too tight. So all the nerves, as they leave the spine, kind of form into this one bigger nerve that might get pinched right down here. And the good news about this is if this is where your pain is coming from, you certainly don't need any back procedures. This actually gets relieved pretty well with anti-inflammatories and physical therapy. So the second warning sign, the second thing to be on the lookout for, is any pain or heaviness that's in the legs or in your butt when you stand and walk, and it's relieved or it gets better when you lean forward or you sit down. So this might signal that you have a pinching of the nerves right in the middle. And the big word for this is neurogenic claudication. Again, not something you can see. But the thing to think about this is shopping cart sign. That's what we call this. So if you ever go into the shopping cart or into the shopping malls or into the grocery store, and you see people that have to kind of lean over on their grocery cart in order to get down the hallways, that's usually a result of this. Because leaning forward opens up the back, and it gives all of those nerves more space. Standing straight like this pinches those nerves in the back, and that's when you start to feel that pain shooting down the legs. They essentially go to sleep, just like when your leg goes to sleep. The third warning sign. So pain in the back or legs when any time you're standing or any time you're upright, and it only gets better when you lie down flat. Um, so that might signal that you have instability between these two spinal bones, this one slipping forward, that one slipping back. And the word for that is spondylolisthesis, which I looked it up would actually score you 78 points in Scrabble if you are ever able to do it. You never will be, though, because there's only 15 letters on the Scrabble board, and that's, like, way more than that. So um, this is something that's pretty rare, but it can happen with arthritis of the spine over time. These are just a couple of CT scans and MRIs where you can see that. This bone starts to slip forward on the other bone. That can pinch a nerve there or pinch a nerve there. And that's something that is sometimes a warning sign. Fourth one. 
a loss of any strength or sensation in your legs, or a loss of bladder control. Now, this is the kind of thing that most people probably will go to the doctor if they experience this, but these are the kind of things that just to be on the lookout for. So that may signal that you have a lot of compression of your nerves at some point in your back. So this is a picture of, this is a pretty extreme example, but you can see the muscles are much bigger on this side than they are on this side, and that side than that side. That might be a sign of a nerve getting pinched so that the muscles atrophy or they get smaller, they can't grow like they're supposed to. The other way this kind of comes into play is something called a drop foot, which is normally you're able to bring your toes up to the ceiling. Sometimes if you have a lot of tightness on a nerve, you're not able to do that, and the foot falls down, you're not able to bring it up all the way. That's something that you should come in for. Now, of course, loss of bladder control, that's the one thing that you should know is an emergency. If suddenly you become incontinent and you never were before, go to the ER. Most people would do that anyway, but just in case. The fifth one is if you lose the dexterity in your hands or you lose the ability to do things like use chopsticks, handwriting, or do your buttons. Um, this is something that usually comes over a very, very long period of time, but it's something that if you notice, is worth at least coming in to see somebody for. The other way this could present itself is if you suddenly start losing your balance. Now, loss of balance is something that happens for a variety of reasons as we age for a, and a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. It doesn't necessarily mean you have something going on in your spine. But if you notice it, it is something worth getting checked out. So this is something that may signal pressure on your actual spinal cord, which is called myelopathy. And the key thing here is that this might be painless. So you may not notice anything at all wrong with your neck. You may just notice that suddenly you drop things a lot. Your handwriting gets messier. You can't do buttons. And you may have no pain in your neck, no pain in your arms. This is something that happens sometimes. That's just what to be on the lookout for. And then you just come and see me if you have that. Now, the reason that you have this is because the spine is like a highway. So this is the brain right here, and this black stripe, this is the spinal cord coming all the way down. So you can see down here again, this white fluid, there's lots of space for the spinal cord there. And right here where these arrows are, that spinal cord is getting pinched, even really badly right there. The reason you lose the use of your hands with that is because this highway between your brain and your arms and your feet is starting to get a little bit of traffic. When the highway looks like this, which is like the 405 never, um, there's lots of space cars can get through really quickly. The signal from your brain can get down your spinal cord and out to your hands and tell your hands what to do really easily. Now, when it starts to look like this, this is essentially traffic, which is the 405 always, um, there's, it's a lot harder for those signals to get from your brain to your hands. So your brain tells your hands to pick something up, have neat handwriting, not drop something, and it's just not able to do that because the highway is blocked because there's traffic there. Uh, number six, and again, we're getting even to the more rare and rarer territories we go on. It's very, very rare. But severe, unrelenting, unusual pain that awakens you at night, especially if you have fevers or chills or you have a lot of weight loss, I just want you to come in and see so that we can check everything out. It may signal an infection or a pathological process of the spine, and that's called osteomyelitis, which is an infection in the spine eating away at the bones right here. Again, very, very, very rare. And the seventh and last one is pain after a fall in anybody over 60 or progressive loss of posture or seeing progressive hunching over like this. So if you have pain in your back after a fall, especially if you lose kind of your posture, that may signal a fracture of the spine, which is called a spine fracture. Okay, they're not all hard words. There had to be like one or two easy things in there. Um, the good news I can tell you about this is, especially for people over 60, almost all fractures of the spine will not require any surgical treatment. And in fact, most times they may not even require bracing. They will require a visit to your primary doctor to kind of check out osteoporosis to see if your bones are too thin, but it will almost never need a surgery. So that brings us to the next question, when is surgery necessary? Well, this is only one slide because it's pretty easy, actually. We talked about a lot of this, but in most cases, it's only necessary after conservative treatments have been attempted and you are not happy with the results. And most importantly, it's when you are ready to have the surgery and desire more complete relief of your pain and you've tried all these other things, that's usually when sur surgery is necessary. And the only exceptions, which again are very rare and happen in less than 5 to 10% of back pain, are when you have a lot of weakness, an unstable fracture, your hands aren't working or your balance is worsening, or you have any of that incontinence we talked about before. So last thing we'll talk about really quickly is what's new in spine surgery. So one of the most exciting things about spine surgery and kind of why I was drawn to it is that it's really in its infancy of the technology that we're getting now. 
every year there's more and more technology that's coming out and it's making us better at what we do and it's allowing us to heal people in a much more functional way than we've ever been to before been able to before so first thing Whenever I put spinal fusion up here, most people's reaction is something like this, because if you've ever typed spinal fusion into the internet, you've had lots and lots of terrible stories that come up. Um, and that's kind of deserved, actually. So why did fusions go wrong? Why does fusion have such a bad name? There are several different reasons, and they've all kind of come together. And the good news about this is we've really figured a lot of these out, and the technology is continuing to improve on this. So some were done on the wrong patients. Some were done on patients who didn't necessarily need a fusion, even though in the past we thought they might have. So for me, if you can take the pressure off of a nerve, and this is somebody who needs surgery, has pressure on nerves, if you can take the pressure off of the nerve without a fusion, you always should. In the past, we didn't really know the effects of having a fusion, and so not everybody was aware of that. And so some were done on the wrong patients. Some were done for the wrong reasons. Just having back pain is not a very good reason to get a spine fusion. And we've gone through that lots and lots of different ways in this lecture because there are so many different things that can cause back pain, and so few of them actually are fixed or need a spine fusion. That's why sometimes they've gotten a bad name. Some were result of the natural disease progression. So if you have arthritis in your right knee and you get it fixed, they can replace the whole thing, you might also get arthritis in your left knee. The same thing happens with the spine. You've got 25 different joints in there. Any of them can go bad at any time. Sometimes when you have one of those joints go bad in the effusion, the next one will occasionally go bad. That's not necessarily a failure. It's just something that progressed as the disease progressed. Um, some did not restore the natural anatomy. So this is one of the things that's the newest in the field. We've just really started to begin to realize the effects of having a natural swoop to your back and the natural anatomy and maintaining that has on the later function after you've had a spine surgery. And then some were done without today's technology. So took us some of the newer things we've got going on right here. So this thing that looks like it's straight out of Robocop, um, this is actually an intraoperative thing that we use for imaging. It goes around the patient, and it's like an intraoperative CT scan. So it allows us to see exactly what we're doing with imaging at all times during the surgery. It gives us a live picture of exactly what's going on. This has greatly reduced the incidence of screws that were placed in the wrong area or screws that were dangerous, because now we can see exactly what's going on. And the advent of this has allowed us to do a lot more minimally invasive surgery. So a lot of the spine surgeries that were kind of bigger surgeries, bigger incisions, were that way because we couldn't see exactly what's going on in the front of the spine when we were in the back of it. Now, this gives us that image, so it allows us to do a lot less dissection, a much smaller incision, and get people out of the hospital faster and with less pain and less blood loss. So robotic assistants, I'm going to give you the caveat that I do not use these because I just don't trust robots enough yet. It's a little bit too Terminator for me. Um, but these are here. They actually have robotic assistants. These arms will come in, and they will assist you and help you put in some of the instrumentation into the spine. It's very cool. Maybe someday I'll use it. I just am not doing it yet. Um, restoring the natural alignment. So this is what I was getting at before. So in the last several years, we have realized how important it is to restore exactly what God and nature gave you in your spine when we're doing anything to the back. So the, the normal spine has this natural S shape. It's got this curve here, this curve in the opposite direction here, and then this curve right here. And restoring this curve is vital to keeping your head centered over your hips and pelvis, and that is vital to keeping you from having any other problems in your spine after we fix one problem. So one thing that's developed over time, and some people get this as a result of surgery or just as a result of arthritis, is having a flat back. And you may see this in some people that you know. So this normal curve of the lower back right here can flatten out with time, and this will gradually pitch people forward. The way that your body compensates for that is you bring your hips back like this to bring your head upright and to bring your eyes straight again. But what that does is it causes a lot of stress on your hips, a lot of stress on your pelvis, and in fact, it can lead to more problems in your back at higher levels after time. This is one example of that. So this is a spinal fusion that was done here on the lower back. And you can see these rods right here, they're very, very straight. So instead of having the normal curvature of the back, this spine is straight. And you can see this is what somebody is going to look like after they've had a procedure like that. This is kind of a, a resulting procedure that we can do to restore the natural curvature or the natural anatomy of the patient. And this allows everybody to walk upright even after these surgeries. And most importantly, it keeps this from progressing. It will keep you from having to need another surgery at a later time because we restored the natural alignment. 
We can do that better now because of the advancements that we've had in some of these implants. So um, this is the spine that's been fused. It's actually a case of mine. So this case was done very well. Um, and these are right here, little spacers. So these discs are taken out, and this is a spacer that replaces that disc. So this is somebody who had one surgery, and then two surgeries, and then three surgeries, because the sort of areas above that were previously fused kept going bad. The disc kept going bad. And then I got the patient at this point when this disc had collapsed, and this was very straight, and this had gone bad. So you can see these are the old implants. They're just these straight pieces of metal. We now have these newer implants that sort of expand like a car jack, and they allow us to bring back the alignment, to bring back that natural curvature and alignment that can get us into this position to uh, hopefully not have any more of this, no more of these problems. So we're hoping this is going to be the last surgery ever after we've restored this alignment. So what are the principles of a successful spine surgery then? So in my mind, these are kind of the four tenets. So first, always attempt conservative treatment whenever it's possible. Maximize conservative treatment whenever it's possible. In fact, if there's any patient that comes into me, you're probably going to have to ask me to have a surgery on your back if it's an elective surgery, because I think that you should try everything you can first, try and get relief of your pain, and only use surgery as a last resort. Only do what needs to be done. So there are a lot of different levels in your spine. There are a lot of different things that people could fuse or could operate on. It's best to only do what you have to. Maybe someday you have to come back for something else, but it's the best to keep as much natural anatomy as you possibly can. Only fuse when necessary, and when you can, spare all of the motion that you can. The more motion you have in your back, the better off you'll be in the future. When fusion is necessary, always restore the natural alignment. Always get that swoop back to the spine. Um, so that's the end of my spiel so far. We're going to go into the questions soon. I just want to thank you all for coming out here. This is a huge crowd. I'm going to tell myself you're all here for me and not the coffee. Um, it's not the case. Don't tell me. Um, again, I'm John Flame from Coastal Ortho, and I want to thank Providence for giving me the opportunity and the lecture hall here for all of this. Thank you. The real answer to this is if you do not have any weakness in your legs, you can wait as long as you want to. You can wait as long as you can tolerate in order to do that. With those few exceptions I talked about, there is not really a lot of detriment as long as there's no weakness to waiting until you are ready to do something more. So for most of my patients, that's only after they've read up on all the options, they've talked to their family, they've tried all the treatments that they're ready to. Now, you know, it's not to say that there's never a time to do it. If you're in a lot of pain, if you're not doing the things that you want to do, if you're not living the way that you want to live and you have something that can be helped, that may be the next time to move on. But beyond that, there's not really a whole lot of detriment to waiting if you just have back pain especially. Um, this is a good question because I actually have several patients that travel a lot and uh, I've had more than one person tell me that they make big use of Dick Sporting Goods because they usually have these inversion tables that you go and hang upside down on. So they'll pretend they're going in to buy one of these tables in a place they don't even live, and they'll just hang upside down for about 30 minutes until somebody kicks them out. Um, so what hanging upside down does, this is essentially traction on the spine. This is something that you'll do in physical therapy also. It lifts up on the spine to relieve some of the pressure. So this helps a lot of people sort of in the moment. It's that kind of a fix. It's pro you probably have to hang upside down like 23 hours a day to have any kind of permanent effects. And again, that's not very safe or good for your work schedule. Um, so hanging upside down can help. It can give you temporary uh, relief of your pain, but it's usually only while you're hanging upside down. So if you have an inversion table and you have the money to get one, it's, it's not a bad thing. But once you come back upright, most people find that their pain returns after a few minutes. So it is in patients that I know have a significant herniated disc in their neck that's causing quite a bit of pressure that I do recommend caution in having your neck adjusted. Now, that said, even in probably 99% of those cases, there's still no danger. But that 1% risk is pretty serious if that actually happens to you, and it's 100% if it happens to you. So if you do have any kind of a neck issue where you think you might have pressure on the nerves, that's usually when I recommend just staying away from neck adjustments. But there are a lot of other chiropractic treatments and chiropractic modalities that don't involve neck manipulation, and you should be more than comfortable doing those. Um, they'll also do traction. They'll also do a lot of different therapies, and that's just fine. There's no danger there.
So um, you notice there's a, I've kind of noticed a theme in the question. So there are a few things that you've probably heard on TV and you've heard in commercials that you'll notice that I didn't really bring up in my lecture today. And the reason is uh, everything I've put in today is everything that has a good basis of clinical evidence for it. So there are a lot of different treatments out there, and some of them are maybe promising in the future, but we aren't quite there yet, and they may not quite have the support of good quality research at this time. Stem cells kind of falls into that category. So there's a lot of promising research in stem cells, especially for things like shoulder arthritis, knee arthritis, hip arthritis. There is some evidence that's showing good, good data in that, although it's not quite there yet. Um, there really hasn't been much promise in the spine world for the PRP injections and the stem cell injections. Not in any of the research that I've seen in any of the kind of good journals. Now, we may get there at some time. The thing about stem cells, you can go into a lot of stem cell clinics, and they can take your blood, or they can take your fat, and they can do something to it, and they can inject it anywhere. But you don't exactly know what you're getting, because that's not regulated by the FDA in any way. So right now, there's no regulation of what somebody does when they tell you they're injecting stem cells into your body. It could be literally almost anything. That's the biggest problem. Now, if you go to a big research university, if you get into a research study at UCLA or USC, you probably do know what you're getting there, and you're getting high-quality stem cells or PRP. If you're getting it in an office setting, you may be getting that, or you may not be, and it's hard to know because it's not really regulated yet. In the future, I think they're going to start regulating this in a better way that you can get more consistent results and you can more consistently get what you want. That's why most of those things, they, insurance doesn't cover any of that. That's only going to be a cash payment um, because insurance will only cover things that we have good evidence for. So it's kind of an indicator of why they might not. Yep, exactly. So that falls into the category of the, uh, what the pain management doctors typically help us out with, epidural steroid injections and nerve blocks into the sets. That is something that I think has very few downsides and it's worth trying. And the way, the, the path that usually goes is you'll go to the pain management specialist, they'll evaluate you and decide what you need, be that uh, an injection of a steroid or one of these nerve ablations or nerve blocks, they call it. So around each one of your vertebra, around all of your back, there are tiny little joints in between each one. And those can sometimes be some of the generators of back pain. So the nerves that go to those little joints, they give you the sensation in your back that is pain. So what the pain management doctors will do is they'll first use a little bit of a numbing medicine, like when you go to the dentist, like a lidocaine, and they'll block that nerve so that it can't get to the joint, it can't cause that pain. If that works, they go on later with a little tiny probe that has like radio frequencies in it just to burn away that nerve. And burning away that nerve doesn't really, it's a very small nerve. The only thing that nerve does is give you sensation to your back. So it doesn't really have any detriments. You won't get weak from it. You won't lose any strength. Um, but that's the concept behind that. And for some patients, that can be very helpful. So this is something that was tried a little bit more um, in the past. I think they said the 2008, so this is about 10 years ago. It was tried a little bit more in the past. The goal of that kind of a surgery is to get a fusion, is to achieve a fusion in between the bones so that they're not moving around, but without having to use the extra incision that it takes to put screws in there to stabilize it. Um, this isn't done very much anymore. It does work sometimes. So the goal of that surgery was to kind of minimize, make a more minimally invasive surgery and not put those screws in. Um, and that works sometimes, and it works very well, but it doesn't work all the time. So um, I don't typically do that right now. That's not really the standard of what most of us are doing now. But when that does work, it works quite well at avoiding a little bit more of that dissection. Um, There's a certain surgery, which is also a minimally invasive surgery, through about a one or two inch incision, um, where you go in under a microscope and you take off just a little bit of bone, and then whatever piece of disc is actually pushing out or pushing back on a nerve, you just take out that little piece of disc and you close everything back up. So that's called a microdiscectomy. That's one of the procedures that we do. So that is the important part about that is that is a surgery that's usually reserved for people who are kind of on the younger side and have a disc herniation. So if you are lifting something or you have a sudden like crack in your back or a sneeze and then all of a sudden all at once you get a pain that shoots down your leg and you've never had anything like that before, that's a disc herniation. So a disc is kind of like a jelly donut. If you picture smashing a jelly donut really quick, that jelly might kind of squirt out of the middle of the donut and it might 
irritate a nerve. Um, this is the kind of procedure that's good for that, and that's usually for sort of younger people, 30s, 40s, 50s, who have all of a sudden a pain. Now, that's different than a disc bulge, which is another word that you might have heard sometimes. So a disc bulge is more like if you take a jelly donut and you slowly, 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 slowly start to push on it. The jelly might not ever actually come out of the donut, but the donut will get bigger and wider around. And that's what happens with arthritis, and that's what happens with really long-term back pain or long-term problems with your disc. Over a lot of time, that jelly donut will just get wider and wider and wider until it pinches a nerve. And that procedure is not so good for when you've had kind of chronic, long-term pain. It doesn't tend to work as well for that. But it is you know, still a good option for a lot of people that have these problems. Um, uh, Quitinimus and hip pain may be a sign of a spinal issue. So it's something that you can uh, certainly go and get checked out with imaging. A more typical thing that you'll feel when you have some tightness in your back is a pain that shoots from your back all the way down your leg, all the way to your calf, all the way to your foot. One pain like that pretty commonly is going to be coming from the back, um, although not always. Now, if you have two sort of separate things, if you have some numbness in your foot but also some pain in your hip, that might just be two separate problems. You may have something that's causing pain in your foot that is not coming from your back, and then maybe hip arthritis or something else causing pain in your hip. many reasons to have sort of loss of balance over time. There are also many, many reasons to have incontinence over time. Um, having it just once and all of a sudden and then having it go away is not usually a sign of having something that's going on in your spine. And usually when you have this problem and it's being caused by your spine, you're going to feel something else. It's not just going to be that you suddenly, you know, have this problem with incontinence. You're probably also going to have pain down your legs, weakness in your legs, numbness in your legs. You're pain in your back, possibly, you're probably going to feel something else. It's probably not going to be just that. So if when you're standing, the pain is just in your back, um, and that means above the belt line for the purposes of the back, if it's above your belt line, usually that's just coming from the muscles and the supporting structure around your spine and not your spine itself. Now, if when you stand up for 20 minutes, that pain in your back is below the belt line, it's kind of in your butt area, that's something that might be coming from the back, and that's worth getting checked out. So we talked about the muscles in the back and how that can sometimes be a cause of your back pain. The most common time you'll feel that is sometimes early in the morning or when you've been down and sitting for a particularly long period of time. That's when all the muscles, because they're not moving, can start to get stiff, can start to tighten up, the joints can tighten up, and then when you finally do get up, that's when it's the worst. So one of the questions I ask a lot of people if I think they might just have pain coming from the muscles around the spine is when is it worst? If it's worst when you first get up in the morning and then as you start moving, it gradually loosens up, that's not usually coming from your spine itself. That's usually coming from the muscles around there because they're very tight at night because they're not moving, and then as you loosen them up, they start to get better. That's the kind of thing that we usually can fix pretty well with physical therapy, exercise, anti-inflammatories. Um, the biggest difference between herbal medications and things that we consider sort of medication medications is FDA regulation. So things like Advil and Aleve and ibuprofen, the things that you buy from a pharmacy, those have to be tested, they have to meet standards, you have to know exactly what you're getting. So herbal remedies aren't required by the FDA to be anything, really. They don't even have to be what they say on the label. And a lot of times with some kind of lower quality products, it's nothing that it says on the label at all. So the important thing about using herbal remedies is to make sure you have a good, trusted brand. You can usually find the reviews online to know that it is what you're getting. There's independent places that do test some of those um, uh, products. Nature's Way, I've found, is usually a pretty good product. It always consistently gives you what you are getting on the label. That's probably the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, that's a good question, and that is a pretty big category of people that do end up getting kind of the larger spinal surgeries. So if there was an old surgery that was done, if it fuses a back in kind of a flat position, 
there are procedures that can be done to go back and bring that back to a natural alignment and restore that straight up and down. So that's one of the categories of things that can improve with surgery. Um, so most insurances in Medicare and Medicaid, they will give you a certain number of physical therapy visits per year. So the key in those visits is to kind of center in on what you're able to do at home. So part of the therapy session, most of the therapists that work here and that we work with, they're going to focus on teaching you some of these things that you're able to do at home. And almost all of them are going to send you home with good home exercises, good home stretches, things that you can then do on your own. And then keeping up on that is kind of the, the process of keeping your back healthy. So even at the end of your therapy sessions, you should be able to get something that you can continue doing back at home. When we talk about sciatica, we're kind of talking about two different things. So we're talking about pain that shoots down usually the back of the leg and comes from the back. So there are two causes of that, two things that can cause that. One is if the nerves are getting pinched right as they leave the spine or they get pinched in the spine. And the other thing that was up there briefly, we can go back to it, but is piriformis syndrome. Right there. Yeah. So that's when that same nerve, so when the nerves all leave the spine, then they form this really big nerve, this sciatic nerve, they can get pinched in between these two muscles. So the key is to figure out which one of those it is and which one it's coming from. When it's coming from this, when it's actually coming from outside the spine, usually therapy or massage or foam rolling, so a foam roller is something that you can buy on Amazon at Walmart that costs about 10 bucks. Um, being able to roll that muscle right there is something that will loosen it up and a lot of times can cause some relief of your pain. So that's one thing that you can do pretty cheaply also. So there's a few questions about um, the Laser Spine Institute. So um, you're see those commercials all over because they have a very good marketing team there behind Laser Spine. So one thing to know about the Laser Spine Institute is that it's not everything they do is necessarily with the laser. They do also offer all the standard surgical treatments, and they have spine surgeons there that every spine surgeon offers. Um, the addition of what they do is using the laser treatment. Now, the laser treatment is actually used in a minority of the people that go in for the Laser Spine Center. Um, it's for a very, very specific thing. So earlier we were talking about that thing of shaving the disc, that little surgery through the very small incision. We go in, we pluck out the piece of disc that's pushing on a nerve, and we put it back. The laser is used for essentially the same thing, except through a little bit smaller incision. What they essentially do with the laser for the laser spine surgery is they put that laser into where the disc is, and they, instead of plucking out the disc, they try and burn a little bit of that disc away so that it gets smaller and so that you have less pressure on your nerves. Um, so that can be helpful in, a, in some limited situations, but it's not, you know, for everybody is the important thing to know. Some people will get better from that, but that may not even be what they recommend in the laser spine center. But I think it can be okay if you have the right thing. Uh, we do. It is usually covered by insurance, though, so you could sometimes have to go through your insurance to see where they'll cover um, so we do have some acupuncturists that are, we have offices in the El Segundo and the Torrance area, so we have different places that we, that we recommend and send people to, and a lot of insurances do cover that also. So uh, it uh, essentially covers all the different things that encompass medical ethics, what's ethical treatment, what we should be doing, what we are doing. It's a philosophy discipline. So something that's useful because almost every hospital has an ethics department on it, and uh, they like to have doctors on it too. So it covers basically how we think about medicine, how we think about the treatments that we're recommending, and how we think about what we should be doing for people and if we're doing it correctly. If your problem is just isolated lower back pain, in most situations, keeping that, you know, keeping fit, keeping thin, doing the yoga and Pilates, doing the physical therapy, doing the exercises, can make the acute pain, the pain you feel right away, go away, and it can prevent a lot of the pain in the future. Now, if you have some arthritis in your back, and, you know, if you've been living on your back for 30, 40, 50 years, um, you're probably going to have some arthritis in there. Almost everybody does once they get past the age of 30. So the result of that is that sometimes you're going to have flare-ups of pain in your back. 
I wake up every once in a while and I can't really get out of bed for 10 minutes and I have to rock myself out and I can't put my socks on and I should theoretically know everything to do for the back. But even I get that sometimes. So everyone's gonna get a little bit of that back pain. The goal of doing these exercises is to spread those exacerbations or those flare-ups apart as far as you can and get rid of them as fast as you can. And the exercise and the things like that is the way to do that. So the open MRIs um, don't have you in the tube. They have you in a much larger area. So a lot of people with claustrophobia are better that way. Um, there's a few other options. So they can always give you maybe just a one-time medicine that helps you kind of take a nap while you're getting the MRI. Some people are able to do that. Um, if it's really, really severe, you can actually get full anesthesia to be put out for an MRI. I don't recommend that, really, unless you really need to sleep. But it's one thing that you can do. And the last option is sometimes we can tell things just from a CT scan. So a CT scan is much faster than an MRI. An MRI is that narrow tube, and you have to stay in it for 30 or 45 minutes. A CT scan is essentially just like a really quick x-ray. You go through the tube in about 15 to 20 seconds, and most people can tolerate that. And sometimes we can tell different things just from that CT scan. So for people who can't take the anti-inflammatories um, for one reason or another, usually I recommend turmeric because it's a pretty safe alternative. It's okay to take with bleeding. It's okay to take if you've ever had stomach problems in the past. It's okay to take if you've had ever had any kidney problems. So it doesn't have too many side effects, and it's usually okay to take with those. So when you're not able to take the kind of prescription anti-inflammatories, that's usually something that I'll make people lean towards a little bit more. There are also some topical things that you can put on. So they're the same medicines. They're also anti-inflammatory, but you don't have to get them going through your whole body. You don't have to swallow a pill. You can just kind of put them on top and use them topically. Sometimes that's an option, too. But there have been a few studies about braces and if they can help, and they're good, again, for kind of the short-term kind of an issue. So some of my patients will feel a lot better once they get the support of a brace. They have braces that they just you just go around kind of the lower back right here, and they give you more support, and they let you feel a little bit more stable when you're walking. And for just when you throw your back out or you do something that really hurts, that can be really good for kind of short-term pain. I do kind of try to steer people away from using those like every day all the time because when you use a brace for a really long period of time, you're keeping your muscles from doing the work of holding you up, and you're kind of relying on the brace instead. So then that tends to weaken the muscles in your core, and that kind of goes against what you need to have long-term pain relief in your back. 